Now, the idea that we're doing here is to do a, um, an Ignite presentation. And the way this works is the slides start and they auto advance every 15 seconds. You got five minutes to make your point and then you're done. <laughs> Uh, we're not we're not doing any feedback or anything like that, so it's it's just. Uh, you got a big cane from the side of the field. <laughs> That's about it. So Pete, you want to come on up? Oh boy. Okay. This evening I'm going to talk about a thing that I'm feel very uh, passionate about. It's called the uh, uh, <laughs> window watcher. I feel the window watcher should be in the. Uh, above the uh, rear windows of every house in St. Petersburg. And the reason is this, we have uh, burglars in St. Petersburg who have a unique way of, of working. These are amateur burglars. You know, the amateur burglars are, uh, take opportunities and like a, an open garage or a bicycle out front, something like that. We're not talking about the uh, serious burglars that can pick locks and so forth. It's St. Petersburg where these fellows seem to operate. They operate uh, very successfully with uh, homes that are nobody's home. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for homes that have very large uh, uh, fences in the backyard, you know, and lots of bushes and uh, of course no car out front. But they have to find out as they approach this house, well, is there anybody home? Well, they'll go and, and, and of course knock on the door or uh, ring the doorbell and, and in hopes that nobody comes to the door. But if somebody comes, does come to the door, well, they'll have an excuse. We're taking a survey. We're looking for a lost dog. Uh, we're going to check your water meter. Well, if there's nobody coming to the door, fantastic. Around the house they go and they're looking for the vulnerable back window, a, a, a window that maybe had nobody, uh, maybe the neighbors can't see very well. They climb in and they start collecting things in the back, in the, in the house. Uh, maybe the, the laptop TV, the, the laptop uh, computer, the TV, uh, uh, jewelry, stuff like that. And they collect it and they bring it all to the front door as best they can. When they're at the front door, so they quickly gather together and they bring it out to the waiting uh, car or, or truck and take it off to sell it. So what are these fellows really afraid of? Well, they're really afraid of going to jail. They don't want to do jail time. They don't want a, uh, a police record. They're afraid of going to jail, so they're nervous. So they go around the back of the house and they're looking for that best window to, to break into. Now, what would happen if they approach that window and all of a sudden an alarm goes off above the window? What would they do? Well, I think they'd leave. The interesting thing is they leave without doing damage to the house, without scaring grandma in her rocking chair or little Susie uh, the last key kid watching television. Well, we have burglar alarms that we certainly have these services, you know, that we, that we buy. Aren't they enough? Well, no, they're not. You see, the burglar knows that he has five minutes. He has five minutes guaranteed before anything happens in the house, except for maybe some noise. He has time to gather the goodies. He has time to gather it all by the front door. He has time to scare Grandma rocking in the rocking chair and little Susie watching television. All right, now let's talk about the window washer. The window washer is very much like uh, the security lights that we have in our homes, the ones that go off, turn on when we walk in the backyard. But they have a very wide field of view. Window washer has a very narrow field of view. As a matter of fact, that cone of sensitivity is only about two feet wide. But it's not turned on by dogs and cats that are walking around the backyard. What's inside? Well, it's got a battery, it's got a, uh, a lens, it has a thermal detector, and it has this alarm. 
Now what's next? What's next is I'd love to see this product because I feel so firmly that it's needed. Take somebody to take it to China, come back, uh, sell it, for, make it for eight bucks, using the rule of thumb of five, sell it for uh, thirty-nine ninety-five in the states. Now you know everything there is to know about window washer and why I feel it should be above all the rear windows in most of the homes in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam French, and this is my product, the Pammy Pocket. It's a very cute little cell phone purse for women to use when they don't have pockets. <laughs> Pam French and the Pammy Pocket, my little convenient cell phone purse for women. And I could stand up here all day and tell you all about how great my product is, how I got the idea when I was working in my backyard and usually in a bathing suit, didn't have a place to hold my phone. I had this little uh, change purse I bought at a yard sale, started using it for my phone and it was so handy. So I started looking in stores for something similar, never found anything, looked for a couple of years and decided just to create it myself. My husband sewed up my first prototype in our upholstery shop, and I came up with a name, had a logo designed, found a manufacturer. I had my nieces for my models, and they, we did a video, and they're on my packaging and on my website. And then I, that was a lot of fun having that. And I can tell you all about all my customers who really love the Pammy Pocket, all the different ways they use it, um, biking, boating, at the beach, on cruises and casinos, just all different ways that they love to use it, four-wheeling and zip lining and everything. And I could tell you about all the bloggers who have done all these great reviews on my product and how much they love it. I have some of them use it as like a daily essential because they're either hard of hearing or they have an inhaler that they have to carry with them all day and they say it's the perfect solution for that. I could tell you about all the great shots I get of my kids when we're out boating and stuff because I always have my phone really handy so I can get all those great crazy shots of them. And I could tell you about all the shops that we're in um, and all the fun events I've done, um, the beach and doing all these community events and getting all the great feedback from all the customers and selling my Pammy Pockets all over the Tampa and St. Pete and how much fun that was. I can tell you about the markets we do and how important it is to have a, a consistent place to where people can come and find my product and all the customers who I've bonded with and now they keep coming back for more and how great that is. I can tell you about the great shops we're in, a lot of uh, local shops, um, boutiques, beach shops. We recently even got into Walgreens, our first Walgreens, and to uh, put my phone on Duval Street in Key West. And I can tell you about all my great designs. We've started blinging them. Now they uh, come in all these different uh, bling designs, like for Gasparilla, for pet lovers, pretty much anything you want we can do. We also even uh, got into Tradewinds Resort, and they love the Pammy Pockets so much, now they put their logo on the Pammy Pockets, and they say that all their guests really love it, and they're doing really well there. And I could tell you about <laughs> how we are doing our part to fight against breast cancer and getting women's phones out of their bra and into a Pammy Pocket because we just don't need the added risk, and it's really not good to be holding your phone there in your bra. And, but I really want to tell you how much I love the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, how much it has been the biggest part of my success, how Wayne and Kirk and Rob since day one have made me feel so welcome and have always helped me. We've had so many great speakers that have helped, even um, one of the speakers who gave me the inspiration and the advice to go to Walgreens, and that is actually how I got in before the next uh, meeting. I was in Walgreens, just from the one speaker. Um, we got to exhibit at the fair with the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, and that was really fun and exciting, and we um, got, I got to do my market research, which I didn't even know what market research was before I joined the club. We also were, um, oh, the market research and all the exposure it helped my sales tremendously. All the people 
that came by the table and said they liked my product, actually went home and ordered it online, so that was very exciting. We were also featured on What's Right with Tampa Bay, so that was real exciting. Our products got featured on TV, and um, that helped a lot with exposure and getting my product name out there. And there are just so many awesome opportunities. If you are a member of the club, I can't tell you how many different things you'll find out about, like the contest and different organizations that are there to help you. And just meeting all the different people has just been a lifesaver. So I just really want to say thank you to Ron Smith for founding the club and Wayne for all you do, making me feel welcome, and everybody on the board that made me feel like family. Thank you very much. I am, I am handing her the ugliest, most worn out, terrible cell phone holder in the world, which is mine. It's falling apart. And my question is, what about the other half of your demographics? I, when are you going to design it. one for the guys? As, as soon as I make millions on the girl one, the guys one is up. <laughs> I'll wait for it. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mark Peterson. I'm the designer, prototyper of my wife Jeanette's invention, the pedicure pedestal. Um, I was inventing my own products, and she and I were talking about the inventing process, and she said she'd like to have something to do her toes at home. She's not 14 anymore, and she has trouble reaching her toes, so she said, do something about it. And this is what we came up with. Um, a lot longer time than I thought I had. So, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but this is the first time I've ever done this. Your first time, too, wasn't it? Yeah, okay, there's my excuse, it's gone. This is the prototype that I came up with uh, right now. It's the only thing on the planet. But what we were looking for was something that you could put her foot up, foot up on comfortably. If you think about it, when you were a kid and you went to the shoe store, the salesman would pull up the stool, and you, you sat down on it and had that incline that you put your foot on. Basically, that's what we've done. Uh, we had to make it so it was adjustable to adjust to each person's individual flexibility. And um, she used it for three years before we decided, well, maybe there's a market for this. There are a lot of ladies that aren't 14 anymore and have difficulty using it. This was over in Lakeland, <laughs> by Lake and Patio out there. Um, we were trying to make up a brochure for it. Now, if you'll notice, it looks a lot like a step stool. I took a step stool frame and just changed it around for what we needed. On the, you've got the footrest. And when we get to another shot, you'll probably be able to see the toe rest too. There's a bar that runs across that's adjustable for the size of the foot. Um, and you put the ball of your foot up on the top of it uh, to raise your foot up a little bit so you can get to your toes easier. Then on the top tray, which would have been the top step on the step stool, we put little holes to put the polish bottles in so that when the girls are, are cleaning the brush off, they don't knock the bottle over and uh, ruin any furniture. That's a better shot of it. Um, we have four TV trays at home made out of wood, and each one of them has got damage to them from the little cotton balls with a remover on it. So that's one of the reasons why I like it. Uh, if you'll see that the, the frame is folded up close together, that's so that you can use it for doing manicures. Uh, if you're going to make all of this you might, and you can use it for pedicure, you might as well make it for both too. So we made this frame so that it would fold up close so that you could bring it up close to you, use the edge of the tray for doing a manicure. And then when you're done with it, you fold it up, Stick it in the closet under the bed, the, you know, the old TV shows that slides under the bed. Well, that will slide under the bed. Um, Kevin was talking about stumbles. This was a stumble for me. Uh, the one on the right is my pedestal that I came up with. The one on the left is somebody else's design. We took it to a company that was supposed to do some design changes for us and introduced us to some companies in China that would manufacture it for us. The design changes they made, well, you saw the difference. There was no difference. And they wanted $16,000 for this, plus their contacts in China. So they got halfway there, and then that's when it stopped. You, can, you, can you go back? Nope, OK. The, one you, the picture you saw in the middle was a design change that I had somebody else do, actually a member of the club. And it cost me 1 16th of what the big corporation's design change was supposed to be. And he came up with that, and it looked a lot more modern, and it was supposed to be totally molded in injection molded plastic. These are showing molds that we've made in the process of trying to come up with the product. Uh, okay, uh, Another stumbling block, this mold right here 
it ended up being at the wrong angle to put your foot on. This is the, where the footrest is. And also, it was too flimsy. It needed more ribs in the back. Well, unfortunately, to change it, it's my knees. Unfortunately, to change it, it would cost us $100,000. Well, it cost $100,000 to make the mold to begin with, so I can scrap this one and go and start over again, and then I can take it off on last year's taxes. So you have to be a businessman, too, to do this. You can't just make it, and then it goes to market. Unfortunately, that's the really hard part, being a businessman. If any of you folks know anybody that does their own nails, uh, whether it's you or somebody else, I have cards that we're going to do a crowdfunding. You tell me to get off? I have cards for we're going to do crowdfunding to uh, raise cash to do a, a production run. And uh, if anybody's interested, please come see me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Woods. And uh, I want to say most divers like to stay underwater as long as they can. The Max Air Fins makes that even longer. I'm here to show you how that's possible. Fin technology has evolved very slowly. Hydrodynamics has been ignored. There, uh, here you can see there's little difference between a 1940s fin and a 1970s fin. In two, oh, we're a little ahead of the game there. Um, in 2000, we had a minor breakthrough. The split fin was introduced. Known for its ease of kicking and lower air consumption, it became a new standard, but they don't have the speed when you need it. So our fin top technology to date is what I call the barn door effect. The bigger the barn door, the more, th more thrust. Do airplanes have that? Aren't we in the 21st century? Let's use real aerodynamics, hydrofoils with a high aspect ratio that generate real lift. Articulated hydrofoils solve the problem. Each kick creates hydrodynamic lift in both directions, driving you forward with little drag and little turbulence. Every vein drives you forward by automatically adjusting the optimum angle of attack to create maximum lift. There's no barn door here. We have proven the technology by running, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. So, it's a great fin. We've proven the technology by running 94 tests against the best eight competitors' fins. This is nearly six miles of controlled underwater swimming. Over 60 Max Air prototypes have been tested, including three weeks in Belize, Bonaire, and the Florida Keys. A typical user response is, these are awesome! The average of all the testing chart shows or proves the claims. The first thing we can notice is that the others can't go as fast. They simply cannot match the, tap, the Max Air top end. Here we can see, at a normal swim speed of 1.1 miles per hour, 7% less air is used. When bucking current, you can ha you can have, uh, and you have to go flat out, 27% less air is used. That's where it counts. With any given effort, you can move faster. At low speeds, you can go 12% faster. At high speeds, it even gets better. The effort at for 1.44 miles an hour will get you 1.7 miles per hour. Other fins have had their run. It's time for the new standard. Let's join the 21st century and dive with Max Air swim fins. Let's look at the business end. Good fins have about, are, are about $180 a pair, with expected annual sales of about 25,000 pairs. The gross annual revenue can be as much as $4.5 million. Tooling cost is about $200,000. This makes the amortized manufacturing cost about $40 a pair. After expenses, the net annual income could be about a million bucks. The problem, well, the problem is these fins are a product replacement rather than a product extension, so the big players don't want to play. The only way into the market is to take away their market share. 
To get this going, we need to use social networking and crowdfunding for tooling. With Fins as the reward, we will build a base of 1,000 users. Starting with online sales, we will move into independent dive shops and build from there. To move ahead, we need to produce a catchy video to drive, drive prospects toward crowdfunding and guidance on how to use social media. We need to finalize our manufacturing source and spread the word, the diving revolution is here. Years of development and testing have produced the first affordable improvement in swim fin efficiency in half a century. Now is the time to move this patented product to market. How would you like to profit from it? For more information and videos of our fins, check out techcreationdev.com. I have business cards for anyone interested. Thank you for your attention. Let's, let's do business. Thank you, David. Hi, my name is Alan Marco. I'm the inventor of the smartphone sleeper. It's the smartphone holder that's made for the bed. Um, you just place a base under your mattress and you can have your smartphone up near you. Long ago, you started out with uh, beepers and pagers. That's how I invented the item originally. Um, you know, back then you had to frantically, you hear that go off and search for a phone. We didn't have it right in our pockets or anything. Um, as I was saying, I was on call back then, 24 hours a day, and I got a lot of calls in the middle of the night, and I needed my pager near my head. So I started, that's where I came up with the uh, invention of the smart, uh, back then I called it the beeper sleeper. So I started out with a bunch of sketches and it got my head twirling, left side of the brain, right side of the brain, everything. Um, and it started to really come to fruition that I could really get this thing done. But this was a long time ago. So then I played around with it and came up with the name and the logo. I called it the beeper sleeper and it was uh, the words between some bedposts to show that it's you know for nighttime. And I put it all together back then. Um, it was a lot harder without the internet, but I was able to get all the pieces. I assembled it in my house. I made about 100 units, and um, I was really surprised that I was able to do it. So the beeper sleeper was born, and um, yeah, there it is. Um, and it was a good item. I really used it a lot, um, being on call and everything, but just didn't know what to do after that. Um, this was 1993, I think it was, yeah. Um, I made 100 units, and I thought, now what? And this is what everyone comes to. So I waited for someone to come knock on my door and give me the million dollars. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> no one ever gave me that million dollars. Um, the product just kind of sat and uh, beepers became obsolete, and away it went. 20 years later, I went to watch a movie on my smartphone, and I was holding it in bed, and the idea came to me again. Light bulb went off. Used the beeper sleeper, and I got some rubber bands, and I attached it, and I said, wait a second, this can get some uh, new life to it. So that's when I in, uh, found the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, and I started going to meetings, and. The knowledge was priceless, and you know I thought, hey, this, this could really work. So I just started putting one foot in front of the other, and uh, you know I got the new name. Um, I did a new logo for it, and I started you know really investigating and finding out what I can do with this um, for smartphones instead of beepers as it was back in the day. A lot more uses. Um, before I knew it, I had a garage full of products, and this time I didn't wait for the guy to come knocking at my door with a million dollars. I knew I had to go out and start you know, really investigating it and find out how to sell. Inventing was the easy part. Going to sell out was a, little, was a little trickier. So I searched the internet and you know, how to sell new products and everything, and I started out with um, simple things like eBay, um, Amazon, Etsy, um, 
And I did uh, what they call flash sales. I got hooked up with some companies, um, a company like fab.com. They do three-day sale of your item. I sold about 180 units in those three days. And I was pretty excited. This is when I, about a year ago when I first started. Um, and then, of course, I said I was selling on Amazon and, and, and uh, SD, eBay, and a bunch of other sites. I still am, a, a lot that I don't even remember. I'll get an order sometimes, and I'll say, oh yeah, I forgot I was on that site, like wish.com and stuff like that. Um, so it's the only smartphone holder nightstand um, made to be used in all beds. 80% um, of users check their phones in the middle of the night. It's great for Skype, Facebook, Pinterest, and more. Um, great for watching movies and TV. And now your alarm clock can be right there within reach. And it's not really just for the bed anymore. You can just slide the base under your, under your leg while you're sitting down. Um, you can sit by and watch, uh, you know, do Skype, and musicians can use it to practice, you know, have their stuff, you know, right in front of them. And uh, put it all together, millions of smartphones are sold. Um, there's a huge market for smartphone accessories. There are, people use their smartphones 24-7, and, you know, it makes the perfect gift. And just remember, it's Smartphone Sleeper. You can find me at smartphonesleeper.com. I did just sell um, to 22 stores in Saudi Arabia that I was excited about. And that's it. I'm Al Marco. Thank you. Innovation means something unique to each one of us. Today's technology empowers us to be creative and transform the way things work. It gives us the ability to achieve optimum results while driving greater value. It is the opportunity to think more creatively allowing us to open our minds to new ideas. Innovation is the child of creativity and invention. To me, an invention is to bring something to the table that adds value and makes our lives easier. As inventors, we are always thinking of how to improve on what affects our lives or improve the quality of our lives. It's a passion that seems to be built into our very fabric. For me, the, since I was a little girl, I've always been inventing something. My passion became a reality when my husband came up with a great idea. He said, wouldn't it be not great if we could push a button and your Christmas slice went out in the house and push another button and they came back in? I said, that's the one we are going to invent, and we did. The next product that we invented recently has to do with fishing. We love to fish. In fact, we have been fishing all of our lives. Fishing is another passion, and it turned into an invention to improve on the bait bucket. When going fishing, we always had to have a bucket, an aerator to keep our fish alive, a net to catch the fish, a tackle box in order to carry all of the accessories, a flashlight to be able to see at night to rig up our lines. If you fish, you can relate to the old way of fishing. We, caught, we got to thinking about how to improve the bucket and make it easier to fish without having to carry all the equipment necessary to go fishing. So we came up with a unique system. It is now patent pending and we named it Bait Dipper. I am sure you have heard the saying, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. Provide him with a bait dipper and he will be able to feed his whole family as well. The Bait Dipper is an all-in-one aerator dip net system. The aerator dip net fits into almost any five-gallon bucket. When fishing out of a regular bucket, it is very difficult to retrieve bait. You have to stick your hand into the bucket and chase the bait around until you can grab one. This wears out your bait, and most children do not like retrieving live bait from a bucket. With the Bait Dipper, just lift the handle and it brings the bait to you to select the one you are looking for. The bait are very calm because they do not realize they are being lifted out of the water. This keeps the bait from getting stressed out, making them more active and will live longer. Even the squeamish fishermen will love retrieving their bait. It was Crystal's first time ever touching and selecting her own bait to fish with the Bait Dipper made this possible. On the display, the Bait Dipper, it shows how the aerator keeps the bait alive. Okay, the aerator sits on top of the lid. The aerator tube is connected to the center shaft that in turn pumps oxygen through the tube 
to the bottom of the net to the air stone. On the lid of the bait dipper is a tackle box to carry the necessary hook, sinkers, and leader lines in order to go fishing. Also on the inside of the tackle box are two switches. One uh, is for the light and the other for the aerator to keep your bait alive. The tackle box aerator has a built-in light for night fishing or to use as a flashlight. Comes in handy when you're camping or are need of a flashlight. This is because the tackle box can be removed from the lid. On the lid is a bait window. This is to keep an eye on your bait, ensuring that they are alive and to check to see if the bait are in need of fresh water. It is also fun for the kids fishing at night and during the day. The light that is on the tackle box is attached to the lid, shines through the light, shines to light up the bucket like a lantern. The tackle box lights up as well for selecting the right tackle to rig up your line. The lid can be open to view the bait and to have an access for loading the bait into the bucket. You can use any type of live bait such as shrimp, pinfish, minnows, shiners, and many others to name a few. Another unique feature of the aerator is that it is in a separate compartment located on the bottom of the tackle box and is run with a 9-volt pump used and uses one or two 9-volt batteries. As you can see, we have used our creative God-given talents and innovative passion to create a unique all-in-one fishing assembly. All that is needed is you, a fishing hole, a good fishing hole, and a fishing pole. So keep inventing and have fun using the Bait Dipper. Thank you. Hi, my name's Jeff Brulette, and I invented the ultimate and chilling technology called the Bev Fridge. So unlike the typical koozie where you're trying to maintain a temperature, this device actually has ice in it. So you load the ice in the bottom, ice around the neck on the, on the bottle version, and then you put uh, the lid back on. And once the lid's back in place, even though there's a lot of water in here, because we're in Florida, once you have the lid back in place, you don't get wet. So two things happen. Number one, you stay dry, so you're socially acceptable. And number two, you have the coldest beer, root beer, water bottles of your entire life. So they're uh, available for sale. Um, I do this one. I do a can version. Can one's basically the same principle. Both of these are made for about 95% of the market, including uh, uh, Coke cans, Coke bottles, water bottles to keep it politically correct. Uh, the Coke cans and bottles and cans uh, taper off at about 16 ounce size. So you can do your normal uh, long neck bottles, red stripes, anything like that. On the can one, you can actually do uh, your typical 12 ounce can. And you also can do uh, taller cans like a Monster Energy drink and also the Tall Boys from PBR and other taller uh, companies. The only two uh, sizes on the can that really don't work right now, but I'm working on a different mold for the gasket, is the Coors Light 12-ounce uh, can and the Mick Ultra. They went with marketing to make a smaller or slender can, so it appealed to people who are trying to lose weight and all that good stuff. And then the final version... is a little guy, which is the wine one. So this will take a wine size bottle up to 1.5 liters. So unlike the trip, typical champagne on ice, where you're trying to put a open bucket of water into an unsafe environment at a restaurant and creating a slip hazard, the nice thing about this, especially for patios and the pools and all that, is that it encapsulates the bottle completely. And again, it doesn't leak. So the nice thing is it stays ice cold it's gonna drop the temperature, because remember, I'm surrounding it with 32 degrees. So the longer you leave it in there, the colder it's gonna get. And um, I've had them out at the beach, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. I'm not telling you it's okay to have glass at the beach, but I've had people uh, who, you know, uh, Corona has the world famous glass bottles at the beach in all their commercials. 
Well, try to do that at the beach, and I'm sure you're going to find out very quickly that they don't want you to have glass at the beach. But when you put these glass bottles in here, the nice thing is, is that it actually does create a safe environment. You can go to my website at bev thebevfridge.com and check out a video where I actually drop this on a cement driveway uh, several times and it doesn't break. And then I, of course, take it out and then it shatters immediately. So it will create a nice, safe environment for all your bottles. But more importantly, unlike the typical koozie where you're trying to maintain a temperature, unsuccessfully, by the way, because what all you're doing with a koozie is you're taking the heat of your hand and transferring to that sweater around your bottles or, or cans. So this actually will surround it with ice and drop the temperature. So even if you start out at a uh, supermarket with a bottle off the shelf, you're actually going to go ahead and chill it down. So by the time you get to your picnic or back to your house or wherever, it's going to be chilled down because it's, you know, it's, it's nothing complicated. It's just simply ice. And you don't have to freeze them overnight or anything like that where you have to think about what you're going to do the next day. It's spur of the moment. You can go to a tiki bar or wherever and say, hey, give me a Miller Lite and a glass of ice. And that's it. Um, I've had it out in the market for a couple years. I've been doing a lot of weekend shows because I have a full-time job. And uh, I can't mix the worlds just yet. So I've been able to go out to uh, baseball games. Um, I've been doing a lot of market research at, of course, some you know, bars and beach stuff like that. It's very, very rare that I'll go to a bar and someone says, wow, where did you get that? Who makes that? And I was like, it's me. And I'll usually have a few with me and sell a couple here and there. Recently, I stayed overnight for a, uh, a job function, went to a sports bar, and within five minutes of being there, I sold 12 units. So, you know, you hit this raw tooth that everyone wants, to, of course, cold beer, and that's what it does. So custom logos can be done. Um, wholesale is about six. Retail is about double that. And there's room for everyone to make money on this product. And I have accessorized it as well. So you have a choice of... Uh, the float kit. So if you want to kick it up a notch, it actually will float upright. Again, go on the website and there's a video where this will drop into the water and stay upright. It actually will light up at night for your safety. So if you stay out in, in the uh, ocean a little too late, at least they'll find your beer. <laughs> I just wanted to say this is my first time being here. Thanks to Wayne for him corresponding. and. Um, it was so much information that I hope I remember my pitch. But I remember three things from all this information. I want to go to Cannes with Kevin Harrington. I know I need an aha moment, and I'm really hoping I don't throw up. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, I'm Nancy Berry. Good evening. And my model tonight is Wilson. I usually have a live model, but in this scenario, I think Wilson's going to behave a lot better. Uh, and tonight, I'd just like to introduce you to um, an extraordinary new product in the pet industry. It's called the Woof Dana. And, oh, uh, sorry. The Woof Dana solves the issue of convenience and safety with a fashionable design for your pet to wear. Now, taking your dog out for a walk and taking all the items that you need anymore. I keep stepping away from this, I'm sorry. Um, it's just too much to handle, and frankly, when I don't always have pockets, or I don't want to hold everything in my hand and juggle it, so now you can just put it in the pocket and your dog can carry all your valuables. It's about time the dog did some work. Walking your dog in the park or on city streets or at the beach, you know you can feel secure having your valuables in the Woof Dana. I mean, now you have a live security guard dog protecting your valuables. I, I can't remember the last time I heard that a dog got robbed. The fabulous fashion spin is, it's a spin on a bandana, but what makes it unique is that pocket. It's vinyl lined, it's water resistant, and it's got a zipper, so it's totally secure. So you put your items in it, you zip it up, and it easily buckles on the dog. Whoa, Wilson. <laughs> Not only that, but your dog looks cool wearing it. So I know when I'm taking my dog out for a walk or a run, 
my clothes that I wear usually don't have pockets, and I, I pick them that way because I don't want anything making my hips look bigger. So Woof Dana solves the pocket problem of no pockets, no problem. Now, you can put a lot of things in it, but my four favorite things to put in the Woof Dana when I go out are the poo bags. Okay, you want to do that when they're empty. After they're filled, you might not want to put them in there. Be, be responsible, though, and dispose it. The key, no more getting locked out, no more dropping the key on your way home, and you get there and you can't find it. Cash or a credit card. I know me. I need another bottle of water, cup of coffee. Whoops, it's already, I hit the thing. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Um, also, uh, your mobile phone. Nobody leaves your house for either social or emergency purposes without that phone. So those are my top four. I'm sure you're sitting there wondering what you're going to put in your Woof Anna. So it's not just for everyday versatility. It's a gift thing, but <laughs> we also do a bridal Woof Anna. You know, people treat their pets like their children before they're their children. So they involve them in their weddings. And this is the best way to keep that ring bearer dog traveling the ring from the door to the altar secure and safe. They have a hidden zipper pocket or one on the front for the bridle. So it makes a great sentiment piece and what better way to have your furry best friend involved. Now there's some dogs that don't actually have to walk to the park. They, they go in a stylish ride. And here's Skipper Joe Madden from the Rays taking his two dogs, Winston and Athena, out for a little ride and uh, this is the way they do it in California. I also am a big fan of uh, Chelsea Handler, so I sent her dog, just for fun, I sent her dog a chunk a Woof Anna and I put a bottle of vodka in it because she has her own vodka brand. And uh, about a couple weeks later, she tweeted Chunk wearing the Woof Anna. He looked very handsome, but I did not see the vodka in there. So you can find us on Facebook. Check out our website. We also do a video. And uh, we're on Twitter. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And oh, wait, there's just one more thing. Uh, for those of you who like to go out and listen to music, but you do not want to wear earphones for security and safety reasons, you're crossing the street, you want to hear a horn or have somebody yell at you or a wolf whistle, whatever, well, you can do this. Put your music on, crank it up, put it in your wolf dana, buckle it on your dog, and now you are going down the street, earphones free, hands free, and your dog is your mobile speaker. Thank you. There are two types of people. There's the uh, person who didn't invent something that everybody would enjoy. Maybe something like the, the car stereo that provides you so much music as we travel. Uh, but there is one person who uh, has invented the world's first car stereo and even added TV entertainment before it was all over. And that's when I, that was my first invention when I was still a student at Ohio State. So I'm bringing you something different tonight. Now I'm here on behalf of one of my clients, Transstar Racing, to share with you the potential investor, how the uh, Dagger GT is going to be the fastest, most luxurious streetcar in the world. Our business concept should produce a 200% average annual compound return on the equity. And um, it's going to be a one-of-a-kind niche car. We seek uh, $250,000 to prove we can do 300 miles an hour and meet tailpipe emissions. Phase one investors should get $300,000 back in 12 months. That means they're going to get 20% back in one year and a 209% ROE compounded over the years. Uh, we seek $10 million total in bundled debt and equity for phase two, 12 months from now. This phase should turn another $200,000. Uh, we'll finish both the testing and the mock-up car in about six months, followed by phase two funding, allow us to pay uh, phase one investors $300,000 in about 12 months. 
Our goal is to create a new niche with only one, whoops, one car in it. The Dagger GT will be the only car with over 2,500 horsepower, exceeding 300 miles an hour. We already have a guy in charge of our performance team who set a world's Guinness Book of World Records last October of 283, so we're almost there. Uh, we're going to have the best looking car, the fastest, most luxurious. Our target is the super rich who have the fastest and own the uh, most luxurious car over a million dollars. Uh, phase one will prove we can be street legal and exceed 300 miles an hour, among other things. I'm giving you time to read some of this behind me, even though I'm not referring directly to it. This slide shows the feasibility of our 300 mile an hour claim. We only need 6% more speed to reach 300 miles an hour beyond what Johnny's record was, what he said uh, a year ago. Uh, after funding is complete, the founder will own 52.5% of the company and outside investors will own 48.5%. And our gross profit margin is excellent, available to serious investors. We have to sell less than 20 cars to achieve break-even for phase two investors, which should occur, occur in year two for phase two investors. Uh, we're using a year six evaluation with ultra-conservative assumptions. Our sales forecast is low. And let me say, I know there are a lot of business and financial uh, references that I'm using along the way, but they're all on target. Um, the uh, results of our financial forecast and valuation show that our initial investors should receive about 80 times their quarter of a million dollar phase one investment. 80 times. We uh, believe that we have adequately mitigated all risks. This is highlighted in the right column of the slide where we reveal multiple emissions technologies. While we're conservatively predicting less than 20 sales per year, the Bugatti sold 81 cars in one year our 300 mile an hour world record should put all other cars to shame. The Dagger GT will sell itself. Anyway, there are only going to be three cars that reach 250 miles an hour. Uh, the source of our abilities is our amazing supercharged aluminum engine. It's built using uh, NASCAR technology. Our team includes holders of 13 world records. These include builders, consultants, race drivers, and owners. And various records are listed here on the slide. Our uh, CEO founder, Craig Miller, is located in Fort Lauderdale, as I am. And we're planning on building this car in Broward County, so we're going to build the fastest, most luxurious, comfortable car right here in Florida. And uh, we believe that the uh, new Dagger GT, which is up there, is uh, going to beat all the competition. And let me say one thing before I go. Most people get excited about uh, what our business is all about. So if you're a qualified investor, or our good friends with some, please see me privately afterward. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm a crazy inventor because I brought too many inventions for five minutes. I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to explain you all of this. But my first invention, uh, it was the, I don't know, like, it was okay. uh, the skate with its cell sandwich which is this one. Uh, most of the guys that show the, the, the prototype that I have on the table like to see the, how many miles it goes. It depends on the wind. If you have uh, 20 miles, you could go like 10 miles for hours on that, on that, on that skateboard, this is, which is really good. So uh, I think it's going to be good fun and all that for kids and boys can go and ride that thing. And then um, I've been working on this invention from 
since uh, 2009. If you can see on the pictures, you can go many places. I got two prototypes, and uh, you can ride on sidewalks and even the beach too. So, and this one, this is the other invention that we had that we've been de developing with my wife. Uh, is it we can easily help to change time and record time to any person, saving precious time and allowing to get the world again. You can see it's uh, like a case, and it has a, uh, you can put a, a we put a, a converter inside the case, and uh, it's a power wrench, and you can connect and plug it into the jack and lift the car, and then can, you, you can go and take it down the nuts out of the tire, and change the tire in record time. So it's good for elderly people or people who doesn't have no much, you know, strength to change the tire, uh, a tire. Because it's a, it's a uh, big tax sometimes to change the tire. It's not really easy to go change the tire. You can see there is a, and this one is the wearable harness system. My wife has a, one prototype wearing on right now. People can go and it's in like a, I put it in there. It's a new train uh, way of training and marking every. It's that this technology can help anybody to train in any sport, uh, run, swim, do anything, and can go and it's, it's good for athletes and play tennis like you see in the pictures. It's, it's really good for hello. Yeah, it's good. It's good for anybody who wants to train any sport, which whatever level, swimming. This my wife tried to, you know, swim. And it's really good. You can train any sport. And right now, I'm developing these inventions, but I don't have anybody yet to help me with the, you know, marketing. So I'm trying to go to marketing. I don't know. Let's see what happened, and I think Scott to, you know, give me the, all those knowledge to develop in these inventions. Thank you for, you know, help me with the, with the, with my invention and see my inventions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> well, I didn't finish yet. Sorry about that. <laughs> you can see here my wife, she's riding the bike, and uh, you can use it, almost all the people can use this thing, the, the harness for the exercise, and you can wear it almost indefinitely. You can run, you know, you can uh, do many things with this uh, harness, and uh, I hope I can put it on the market very soon. That depends on how I can, you know, find someone to help me with the, uh, you know, uh, investors, some investor to put on the market. It's not really easy for me, and I appreciate the time you guys helping me to hear about my inventions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And can we, can we get a big hand for all of our inventors, please? Well, that's really what it's all about, is preparing. Um, a lot of people want luck, and uh, I've heard luck defined as where preparation meets opportunity. Um, if you want to be lucky, you're going to have to do some work to get it. And uh, that's really, uh, really important for inventors to, to understand. You need to, you need to put your ideas together. You need to research your market. You need to find out what, what really needs to be done. And then you got to make sure that you're ready when that opportunity does come, that you're ready to seize the day. Because uh, the knock that opportunity leaves one moment is merely an echo the next. So thank you all for coming. 
We'd love to have you guys all come to our Inventors Council. We meet every second and fourth Wednesday, still 30 years now, um, probably a little bit more active than most inventor groups, um, over at the corner of uh, Brian Derry and Belcher. We're hosted by the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, another wonderful group in the community. And um, 7 o'clock until 9 o'clock is, uh, is where you'll learn that you're not alone as an inventor. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Have a nice day.